Hello and welcome to today's Medicinal Monday. I'm Dr. Susanna. And I'm Dr. Ben. And we're both naturopathic doctors who empower individuals in reversing disease and reclaiming optimal health through whole food plant-based nutrition and mind-body medicine. Yes, and today on Medicinal Monday, we're going to be talking about soy because apparently a plant-based diet for a lot of people, they think that means, well, if you're not eating meat, then you must be eating soy which is in fact one plant, but people neglect the fact that there are 40, 50, 60, 70, 80,000 other different plants that one might choose to eat when assuming a plant-based diet. So a plant-based diet does not equal a soy-based diet, but we're going to be talking about soy in depth in greater detail to, to better understand the health benefits and potential health risks associated with eating soy. And then, of course, as with anything, hopefully you will be left empowered, informed, so that you can make the choices in your life as to whether or not you want to bring soy on your plate and into your body. Yes. Yes. This is a great topic. I can't believe that this is the first time we're bringing it into our Alter Your Health podcast because it's it's a big one. And, you know, just to put it out there, I don't even eat soy. We don't eat soy. <laughs> it comes to a surprise to many. I mean, sometimes when we go to the restaurant and it's like, what what kind of protein do you want? Usually I'll say, you know, none, just extra veggies, whatever. But maybe there will be a tofu this or a tempeh this. And I'll be like, okay, I'll, I'll try it. I'll, I'll, I'll give, it a, give it a whirl. Uh, but I think that, I mean, someone gave us like a brick of soy. like, And, that, and I, I think I've only prepared soy once in my entire life. What yeah. about what about you? Um, I ate it in undergrad uh, in college, but that's not. I wasn't even vegan then. Um, I just kind of thought it would be a healthy yeah. source of protein when I was just like chasing the protein, which we know we don't have to do, right? Yeah, and I think I said I ate soy once. I meant I ate tofu once, and of course we'll be talking about it. The fact how soy slips its squeaky hands into so many products on the shelves um, and really gets a bad reputation due to the fact that so much of what is consumed is heavily processed and poisonous soy products. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's just start with some facts, some st statistics that I came across when doing a little bit of research, because I think one thing is that soy gets a bad reputation because it's of like the huge monocrop agriculture growing tons and tons of soy. And yes, uh, 87, 87 million acres of soybeans are farmed in the United States alone, which is a lot of soybeans. And that produces about 124 million tons of soybeans. And it's like, whoa, who's eating all that soy? Uh, if Dr. Susanna and I aren't, who the heck is eating 124 million tons of soybeans? Well, the fact is that about 77%, this is a 2018 statistic, 77% of those 124 million tons of soybeans are going to feed cows and chickens and pigs and livestock. Um, so they're the middleman, they're the middleman, remember? They're eating all the food and then people eat the, the animals. And of course, these are you know, CAFO farmed, uh, what does CAFO stand for? A a a cage of factory farmed, factory farmed animals <laughs> that are predominantly eating soy. But maybe the most alarming statistic here is that 94% of those 124 million tons of soybeans are conventionally grown and genetically modified. And if you know about uh, genetically modified crops, Really, what it means is that they're genetically modified to withstand the harmful effects of herbicides, mainly glyphosate. You know, they're quote unquote Roundup ready uh, soybeans, meaning that they just get blanketed with the glyphosate herbicide and then they just harvest it and feed it to the cows, feed it to the chickens, feed it to the pigs and put it into soybean oil and soy lecithin and soy textured vegetable, vegetable protein and all of these things that get, you know, mixed into so many processed foods and a lot of quote unquote vegan processed foods. So 94% of soybeans are conventionally grown and genetically modified. 
that that's astonishing to me. Yeah. And just a little side note here, actually, um, GMO foods are going through a little rebranding right now and actually will be um, labeled as bioengineered foods. So if you're oh. listening, if you're listening to this, you know, in the future, we're talking about bioengineered. I've also heard biofortified, oh. which sounds even better. Like, oh, I got my 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 food is bio fortified. Yeah, that sounds like a great thing. Yeah, who who doesn't want bio fortified food? Well, I guess you don't, and I don't. Um, so don't yes, be fooled. Knowledge is power. Uh, information is powerful to have. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what people what where the soy comes from, right? Um, but then it gets mixed into and processed into all of these different products. Like I was saying, soy bean oil which is a big part of quote unquote vegetable oil, soybean oil, also corn oil, which is another, another genetically modified crop, cottonseed oil, another genetically mod modified crop. So all these GMO foods are just ugh, mixed up and it's just a toxic soup that is put into so many processed foods. And then there's soy lecithin, which, which is a essentially a preservative. It's an emulsifier, but also keeps things shelf stable. And then there's textured, soy protein or textured vegetable protein which is a heavily processed form of soy that is really what makes the beyond burgers and impossible burgers kind of like chewy and you know have that texture which so many things also have the textured vegetable pro protein mainly the sausages and the meat alternatives and substitutes and, and whatnot and then, you know, there's the um, soy curls. I, I thought that soy curls were actually like a type of textured vegetable protein, but they're less problematic, a little bit more natural. Then there's, of course, tofu and tempeh, which are um, fermented processed soy products. Um, I've never made tofu or tempeh. Like I said, I've only prepared it once in my life, um, but it comes from soy milk which is of course, you know, like made essentially similarly to the way that they make any nut milk or almond milk. Um, but we're getting there. And then there's like protein powders or soy isolate powders where they take the soy protein and make it, you know, so, and then there's, um, what else we got here? Miso, which is another fermented soy product. And then <laughs> there's the, the green soybeans. Or sometimes they're dried and, you know, you can cook them as a dried form of a, a legume, but or you can eat them fresh as like an edamame, right? Um, steamed green soybeans. That's what soybeans are. But really, they get so adulterated and contaminated and processed to create all of these products. And most of the, them are conventionally grown, genetically modified. So rule number one, whenever we're approaching soy, well, there's there's two rules here. Whenever we're approaching soy products, we want to A, for sure, choose organic non-GMO soy products. Like that's a that's a deal breaker, literally for me. Like no way, no way. Um, and number two, try to choose the, the soy products that are minimally processed, most natural. Um, of course, for sure, staying away from soybean oil and soy lecithin and you know, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. So moving forward in this podcast, when we talk about the health benefits of. Oh, I wanted to talk about the nutrition, the nutritional, like just nutritional facts. Cool. Take it away. Okay. Um, so just the nutritional facts about soy, because soy is actually a pretty unique legume, pretty unique um, plant food because it's so rounded, if you will, in terms of its macronutrient pro profile, it's higher in fat. It's got about 44% fat. And we're talking about the whole, whole soybean here. We're not talking about soybean oil, which is of course pure fat. We're talking about the whole unprocessed legume, the soy. Um, so 44% fat, 37% protein, 20% carbohydrates. So it's a low, quote unquote, low carbohydrate relatively legume. Um, of course, every plant food is different in its macronutrient makeup and et cetera. Uh, but it's a quote unquote, high protein, high fat, generally low carbohydrate food. So a lot of people might choose to make soy the center po point of their plate if they're afraid of the carbohydrate rich whole plant foods like potatoes, starchy vegetables, other legumes, uh, intact whole grains, et cetera. 
Um, but if you know anything about nutritional biochemistry and about what we have to say about how the metabolism works, that those, those carbohydrate rich whole plant foods really ought to be the center point of our plate at any given meal. Um, but the other interesting thing about soy is that the protein, the amino acid profile of soy is really balanced. You know, it's got a lot of, it's, it's a quote unquote complete protein, even though pretty much all plant foods are complete proteins. Uh, but soy has a good amount of all of the uh, 20 different amino acids in, in a balanced sort of way. And uh, soy also has a good amount of fat, like I was saying, and about uh, and it's got all of the um, essential fatty acids, the omega-6 essential fatty acids, the omega-3 essential fatty acids, and in a 7.3 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, meaning that it's a little heavy in the omega-6 fatty acids. So that, that's why we like chia seeds and flax seeds and hemp seeds, uh, you know, a little bit better in their quote unquote fatty acid profile. Um, but still, you know, not too shabby there. But it's also got a good amount of saturated fat. About 15% of the fat in soybeans are is saturated. So, you know, something to be aware of. But soy is a pretty nutrient-dense food, all things considered. Lots of vitamins, lots of minerals packed into the soybean, which is the case, I might add, with pretty much all intact, whole, natural plant food, especially legumes, really balanced in their protein and balanced in their uh, uh, amino acids, balanced in their mineral content and vitamin content. Um, so soy is, like most other legumes, a good, rounded, whole plant food, just higher in fat, higher in protein. And therefore, some people think that you need it. So maybe now, you know, that, now that we understand kind of the nut nutrition, now that we understand kind of the various products that we can choose, we can talk about some of the health benefits and then risks. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess, I guess I'd like to just speak to those nutritional facts a little bit and kind of how we relate to soy in, um, you know, from the alter health perspective, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, for, for example, um, we listed a whole bunch of different soy products, the products that, you know, we would deem acceptable to eat in a whole food plant-based diet, you know, we're avoiding the super processed foods are the things like the whole soybeans, uh, soy miso, uh, you know, a little bit of soy curls, it's kind of equivalent to like a chickpea pasta, for example, tofu and tempeh are okay, soy milk, okay. But then once you get into the ultra processed, ultra refined, like protein powders, textured soy protein, soy lecithin and soybean oil, those are really kind of red light foods. But, yeah. you know, we, we like to kind of talk about foods in terms of green light, yellow light, red light. Green light means eat as much as you like of them. Red light means no, not included in whole food plant-based eating. And then there's this middle ground, the yellow light foods, where you can enjoy some of them in, in some amount, but to not go overboard. And we've actually made the decision to put even whole soy edamame in the yellow light category. Mm -hmm. And people often ask, well, why is that? It's a whole legume. Mm -hmm. All the other legumes are in the green light category. The reason we do that is because when you look at the breakdown of the macronutrients, it's almost 50% made up of fat, which makes it closer to kind of the nutrient makeup, not not quite, but it, it makes it closer to the nutrient makeup of, you know, nuts and seeds and right. those fat rich foods, which we don't want to base our meal around or our entire diet around. And so that's really how we we relate to it. And, and we encourage that people, you know, if they want to include soy in their diet, they can, they can make dressings out of tofu. They can, um, you know, have a little bit here, a little bit there, incorporate miso, but, you know, not to, not to base every meal around a brick of tofu. Totally. Yeah. Good point. Thanks for that. Uh, so let's shift gears, talk about a little bit of the health benefits and health risks associated with consuming soy. And of course, this brings us to talk about the quote unquote phytoestrogens, uh, which are, uh, which which are a little bit of a misnomer. You know, it's a phytonutrient. Um, they're called soy isoflavones. And specifically in soy, the, the, the most abundant one is called genistein, and it's sometimes extracted and, and sold as a supplement. Um, but these phytoestrogens are not, in fact, quote unquote, estrogenic. They're estrogen modulating compounds and specifically termed selective estrogen receptor modulators, meaning that they bind onto different estrogen receptors and do different things to those estrogen receptors, sometime 
modulating them in a way to upregulate the effects of the estrogen down, downstream effects, sometimes blocking the downstream effects, um, specifically because there are different estrogen receptors. There's alpha receptors and beta receptors and soy isoflavones bind onto the beta receptors that tend to be more um, in the bones and tend to be, you know, less in the uh, reproductive system, less in the breast tissue, and therefore are, are actually protective in all sorts of ways. Um, so soy also, in addition to it being a selective estrogen receptor modulator, soy is also an aromatase inhibitor, which actually blocks the effects of estrogen or blocks the production of estrogen. So it's kind of like, you know, it can, so it can have this estrogenic effect in different circumstances, but also this clear anti-estrogenic effect in its aromatase inhibition, which by the way, does support healthy maintenance of testosterone levels in men, you know, the aromatase inhibiting effect. Right. Yeah. So, you know, in this next section, we're really facing these myths head on that estrogen or sorry, that soy consumption messes up with messes people's hormones, um, that it's a hormone, you know, disruptor or, or whatever. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really a hormone balancer, a exactly. hormone harmonizer. Um, so in, in terms of women's health, uh, it, it's very interesting because of the fact that it's an estrogen receptor modulator. Soy consumption can upregulate the, the um, estrogenic effects in menopausal women who have kind of a, a sharp decline in their estrogen production. So it can kind of support menopausal symptoms. But for women in their earlier years, in their reproductive years, the estrogen dominance picture is such a common one. And soy actually blocks the estrogen alpha receptor and blocks all of the uh, issues associated with estrogen dominance. So soy is really good for women and females at all ages and stages of their life for that reason. Right. And just to speak a little bit more to kind of what estrogen dominance looks like in the reproductive years, lots of symptoms related to the menstrual cycle, PMS. Um, and of course, for women who are in their menopausal um, years, um, hot flashes, all of the all of the kind of symptoms that can come from decreasing estrogen levels can actually be improved by eating a little bit of soy. Right. Um, so in fact, there's a lot of studies, a lot of research comparing soy consumption to hormone replacement therapy, which is, of course, kind of a treatment an option for people going through menopause. Uh, but hormone replacement therapy, even the quote unquote bioidentical hormone does not come without risks. You know, hormone replacement therapy is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, disease strokes and reproductive cancers. Whereas soy consumption, you know, is associated with the opposite, decreased risks of cardiovascular disease strokes and reproductive cancers. And that has to do with the fact that soy is an estrogen, selective estrogen receptor modulator, meaning that it keeps hormones in balance. And also a big, um, a, a big thing associated with menopause is bone loss because estrogen is so important for calcium balance and bone mineral density. So when people go through menopause, their estrogen goes down and calcium absorption and bone mineral density tends to go down as well. So maintaining healthy estrogen levels naturally or balanced hormones naturally can help maintain bone mineral density. And that is in fact the case with soy. Soy consumption is um, definitively associated, associated with increased bone mineral density and actually helps to create more bone. You know, it doesn't only stop the demineralization process of bone, but it actually helps your body build more bone and as a result decreases the risk of, um, you know, fracture with age. Yeah. Yeah. So now moving on to some of the men's health benefits, I'll let you take that away then. <laughs> I'm just talking the whole time. Um, so yeah, in terms of men's health, you know, the main, the main thing is that, uh, phytoestrogens in soy are not estrogens. So I, I really try to avoid the term phytoestrogen, even though that is like the common term, uh, but they're selective estrogen receptor modulators. And this is the case in men's health as well. They don't push any estrogenic pathways. And like I said before, they contain aromatase inhibiting compounds, 
which keep testosterone more bioavailable for men. Um, so that's a really good thing. So there are some small studies that look at high soy, um, high soy, soy rich diets, which is like a lot, a lot, a lot of soy and tofu and different products. And some studies have found that a lot of soy can decrease testosterone levels in men, at least over a short term period. And then you stop eating soy and your testosterone levels come back. But the bigger studies that are looking at more of like a normal consumption of soy don't find any, uh, you know, negative effects in terms of testosterone levels in men. Um, so really, it seems like the consensus, if there is one, is that soy consumption does not interfere with male hormone balance and, you know, in any sort of negative way. Yeah, I've heard so many myths of people saying, oh, when when men eat soy, they develop boobs and yeah. just all of this, all of these falsities. And, you know, I, I think it's important to bring up also just briefly um, what what is in our environment that is affecting some hormonal dysregulation in men, which are the xenoestrogens, which are different than phytoestrogens, because as whereas phytoestrogens really help modulate the levels of estrogen and other hormones in the body, these xenoestrogens have a very strong estrogen effect in the body. They actually act as if they are estrogen in the body. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up because xenoestrogens are estrogens. And mm -hmm. these are things in plastics and, and other um, herbicides and pesticides act as estrogens in the body. So those are the real things that throw our hormonal balances out of whack for both men and women. Mm -hmm. um, so now talking about some of the risks associated with soy consumption, mainly has to do with the fact that, like I said, starting it off, 94% of the soy products being produced, at least in the United States, are genetically modified, meaning that they are poisonous. They are contaminated with herbicides and pesticides, mainly glyphosate, which is a huge problem for the human body. Um, so that being said, the consumption of soy can be risky if we're not eating organic non-GMO soy products. Um, and even if, you know, you have a history of eating some conventionally grown genetically modified soy products and you've been consuming some glyphosate, the immune system can get a little bit wonky and a little bit dysregulated and therefore also mount an immune response against quote unquote clean soy or organic soy, non-GMO soy. Same is true in the case of gluten and corn and other genetically modified crops. So what you're saying is that people can develop a sensitivity to soy and these other crops that are commonly grown as GMO crops because their immune system is reacting to the herbicide or pesticide or the glyphosate. And so then the immune system associates glyphosate with soy so that even when you eat clean soy, you might still have a sensitivity response to it, a hypersensitivity. Precisely. Yeah. So, so for that reason, you know, we do encourage people to go on a little soy vacation from time to time. <laughs> if they're sensitive. If they're if they're sensitive or to determine whether or not they're sensitive. And of course, we're in the midst of the alter health cleanse right now where we say avoid corn, soy and gluten containing grains for this very reason. And it's not because corn, soy and gluten containing grains are wrong or bad but they are more, more, they can be more immunogenic for this reason, due to the fact that there is such contamination of uh, chemicals or besides pesticides on these uh, specific products. Right. But real quickly, the good news is that even if you are sensitive to soy, you can still receive the benefits of these phytoestrogens because phytoestrogens are found in lots of other plants. Um, the one that's coming to mind right now is red clover, which is delicious taken as a tea. There's also, so many, like flax also has some phytoestrogens. Yeah, flax seeds, um, all sorts of seeds mm -hmm. have these uh isoflavones and lignans that can modulate uh, hormone receptors in the body in a favorable sort of way. Mm -hmm. So as we're wrapping up here, uh, any announcements? Dr. Susanna? Sure. Well, we just wanted to remind everyone that when you go to our website, www.alter.health, you have the option to take a whole food plant-based challenge, a pre-recorded whole food plant-based challenge. And we have several different topics. We've got a detox challenge. We've got an energy upgrade challenge. We've got a, a heart attack proof challenge. And what's the last challenge we have? 
What's the fourth uh, one? Detox. Uh, Anti-inflammatory. Anti-inflammatory challenge. That's right. So if you want to take a deeper dive into understanding really how whole food plant-based lifestyle can support you in reversing disease and and really feel the best you've ever felt before, go take one of our challenges. Um, They're super fun and they're just up on our website. You can take them at any time. They're self-paced and uh, you can work through and leave any feedback or comments that you might have. So thanks as always for tuning in to this Medicinal Monday episode and hopefully now you are more empowered in your decisions when it comes to choosing soy products, whether or not you want to bring them into your body and what they might be able to do for you. And uh, we look forward to staying connected and seeing you guys next time.